We were called to a, a working fire as a trailer fire, and uh, there was a tree down on this trailer, and there was a woman trapped inside. That's what the call was. So my first company got there, and of course it was a working fire. So they pulled the lines, and they were fighting fire. And this tree that had fallen on this trailer was absolutely huge. It went through the middle of the trailer all the way down to the floor. It just, it ripped it open like a can opener. Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Oh, you're trying to bring me down and run me out of town. You're taking what you want, but you can't take my rhythm now. I'm walking to my own beat, just gonna be me. I'm not replicating nobody, nobody. Hey, Youth Worker on Fire, this is Doug. Glad to have you here listening today. And I have a friend of mine, Kevin Tolson. And Kevin is, well, I've known Kevin since he was in was it middle school or high school, Kevin? I think it was uh, junior high. Yeah, I, junior thought, high. I thought it was middle school. Yeah. Or junior high yeah. at that time. That's, that's how old at least I am. Yeah. You were my first trumpet teacher. That's right. I was. Yeah. And one thing that's happened with Kevin and I over the years, you know, you go in and out of relationships and times and somewhere along the way, we caught up together again a few years ago. And Kevin is one of the guys that I call, if I want prayer to happen for something in particular, I have a, just a few people I call. And this is for you guys that are in ministry as well, or even if, you, if you're not in student ministry, but you're in the public school system or something like that, and that's ministry too, especially if you're believing in Christ. You need some people on your team that can, you can trust that are going to keep whatever you ask them to pray for to themselves, unless something else, you know, unless you want them to, to share that. And Kevin's one of those guys. And the reason he's one of those guys is because he has been a fireman for many years. Then he was a fire chief, and he just retired not long ago. And one of my other friends who's on another episode, Rick Eldridge, is producing a movie on first responders. But Kevin is from the North Carolina area, from Thomasville, and now he's moved to the beach in the Carolinas. We were talking the other day after he had done some of the recording with this movie about first responders. I don't even know what the movie is going to be called. So, Kevin, you know, this is for youth workers in particularly. And some of these guys are going, well, why are you talking to a fire chief? Well, because he was an adolescent once. He was a he was a teenager. Exactly. Yeah. All of us deal with teenagers somewhere. All of us, unless we were uh, hatched somewhere, uh, we <laughs> we became a teenager somewhere along the way and uh, went through that phase into adulthood. We started talking, and we're, so we're not going to hit, hit a lot of the points that I normally would hit with some of the people because I want to make sure we get right into the, the thick of it here. Kevin, we talked about one of his first major encounters with firemen. And you were telling us a little bit. I hope you're able to tell us a little bit about your family history. It was 1969. I was uh, eight years old uh, in the third grade, and we had gone to dinner that night and uh, to buy groceries. And I think it was on a, usually a Thursday or Friday. That was a weekly ritual. And uh, we were coming home, and uh, probably about a mile away, we could see red lights from our house. We didn't know it. It was our house. And as we got closer, I told my mom and dad, I said, that looks like those lights are at our house. And my dad, of course, said, no, that's it's not. That's on up a little bit. But no, lo and behold, as we drove up, those lights were at our house. And uh, we lost uh, basically everything. The house is still standing, but inside we lost basically everything. One of the... Um, engineers, what we call an engineer, he's the driver of the truck. He came over to me, and like I said, I was only eight years old. He said, would you like to see the truck? I said, sure, I'd love to see the truck. And after all this tragedy, you know, kind of getting my mind off of that while mom and dad were doing their thing. Lo and behold, this same guy, the first day I worked in, walked into the fire service, he said, I know who you are. And I said, really? I said, I don't know you other than you're, you're my boss. You're my battalion chief. And uh, he said, my name is Ronald Myers. I was there the night that your house burned. 
And of course, my face probably turned white as a sheet. And uh, he said, I was driving a truck. I said, you know what? I remember you. You took time out of your schedule, what you were doing for a living, and you took me to that truck and showed me all about your your truck and what it did. And, you know, that was just, for me, that was huge to be able to walk my first day at work, realizing the uh, gratification that goes with a job. And now I have, I'm standing in front of a guy who took time out of his his day to show me what he did, even though um, it was a, a tragedy was involved in it. That always stuck with me, Doug. You never know what someone's going through. No, you don't. And and the one thing that I remember us talking about about that, adolescence is one of the most creative times in a person's life. And the students that we deal with, those people are going to end up being doctors and lawyers and marrying our kids and exactly, you know, being their our, our in laws and signing our paychecks and all that. But that wasn't directly the line that caused that, at least not consciously, for you to become a fireman. So that was interesting to me. No, it, 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 that's not the reason I joined the uh, the force. I carried that through my career, and as I got into that position where I could really take advantage of that, if I would went to a a house fire or a tragedy, and I'd see a young kid. For example, we had a house fire Halloween Eve, and this young man, he was he was probably uh, six, seven years old. He was dressed up as a fireman, and I watched him. He, he didn't have anything to do. It wasn't his family that had the tragedy, but I watched him because he was watching me, and he was watching us. And so after we had our, after we did our job, I walked over to this young man, and I took pictures with him. I took him to the fire truck to put my gear on him. I told his mom. His mom was there. I said, you know what? I said, this will be a last impression on your son, a lasting impression on your son forever. And I hope he he remembers this, and he takes this, and uh, one day he'll say, man, he said, you know, that uh, that means a lot to me to be able to look back at that history and and remember that somebody done something good for him as a young man and he can pass that on and it will and and, you know and there's other people that you encountered i guarantee this that you had no idea that you influenced but you did right that's right but there's a good thing about being intentional because we should be intentional about who we're trying to influence yes you never know what somebody's going through it there's all different types of tragedy in somebody's life. Alcoholism. You know, I had a, my dad was an alcoholic, and I'm not afraid to say that. My dad was an alcoholic, and I endured that hardship all my life when he was alive. Uh, even as a, at a young age, I was responsible. My mom worked a lot of hours, and I wouldn't see her for a month at a time. She worked strange hours. I was responsible for an alcoholic dad at uh, seven, eight years old. So you never know what somebody's going through. No, you don't. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Maury Buchanan, who's created Mission Discovery, that was his story, too. He had a violent alcoholic father, and he talks about that. And he said, every time I tell this story, someone needed to hear it. Yes. And that's why I had him tell it. And so I, I appreciate you telling this story because it's a secret, it's a secret most kids keep to themselves, exactly. harbor for as long, if not for their entire life, trying to keep the secret to keep from embarrassing the family or keep their dad from losing a job or something. To this day, Doug, my, my two sons, they really don't know what I went through as a young child. And my two sons have never seen me take a drink of alcohol. It made a huge impact on my life that I didn't want to relive and allow my family to grow up in that same atmosphere. That's right. And you don't, you don't. I mean, the, the one thing that we are supposed to do as dads and moms and, and uh, as grandparents is try to make our children have a better life than the life we had. That's it. Yeah. No matter how good our life is, one of the things we want to do is, is, is give them more than we had, help them to learn more than we learn. Oh yeah. Learn from the mistakes that we made and also learn about what we wish we had learned <laughs> that needed to learn, you know, <laughs> yeah. and pass that on to them too. Yeah, that's huge, yeah. It, it is, it is. In fact, let's see, you know, Jordan, you have, how many How many kids do you have again? 
two sons. Uh, Jordan, my oldest, he's 30. Right. And Mason, my youngest, and he's uh, working on 25. Now, Jordan, I know, was in the police force. He was. He was in law enforcement. And what is he doing now? He has started a pressure washing business. Uh, when he was in law enforcement, like when I was in the fire service, we always, all of us had a part-time job. We had a little time off, and I was a painter. And he used to go with me when I was uh, painting and doing some pressure washing. So one day he said, uh, Danny said, I'd like to start a pressure washing business. And it grew so much, it took time away from his family doing both jobs. So he had to end up quitting the law enforcement part of it because his pressure washing business was so blessed by God. And he knows that. He will say that today. I've been blessed by the Lord. He is very successful in the uh, pressure washing industry. And that's interesting. Uh, a lot of guys will spend an entire career. You spent your entire career as a first responder in the fire department, but Jordan didn't. And I don't blame him for that. i tell you what, I know what some of these guys have gone through. Yeah. In fact, I have a brother-in-law who, one of the reasons he, he got out was because of the severe tragedy he saw, and especially of one particular child, from my understanding. It was just, it was overwhelming. But it takes a lot of time for your family. It takes a lot emotionally. It takes uh, a lot for you to have to overcome that. And I remember one thing you told me about your wife. You'd retired, and they said, well, why don't you come back and do it part-time or do something? I, I forgot how they said it. And she said something very interesting because you went through a, a lot with her health. And that was she said, no, I've given him to you long enough. Yes. He's mine now. Well, when I retired at my retirement annual awards banquet, I gave a speech and I told him, I said, you know, the one, one of the biggest things, if you're a career firefighter, you'll spend 30 years in North Carolina, it's a 30 year service and you'll spend 30 years away from your family. And my wife raised two fine men, probably 75 to 85% by herself because I was gone all the time. I followed a career path that required me to take a lot. I, I went to school from the day I walked in to the day I, I retired. And I told them in front of, every, told her in front of everybody, you know, you looked after me for 30 years. You made sure that I was of good mind, sound body, and it's time for me to come home and look after your needs. Whatever those needs are, I'm there for you now. So, you know, it it makes a huge impact on your family, being a first responder and being away for those uh, that uh, amount of years. You miss birthdays, you miss Christmas, you miss family outings, friends, you miss ball games, you miss a lot. And uh, those things that uh, you just can't get back. But uh, you can uh, you can definitely dedicate yourself to looking ahead and uh, nourishing you know, the rest of your, the rest of your time. And let me tell you what, it does take a strong woman that, you know, as well as I do, many, uh, first responders, firemen, policemen end up going through divorces because of all the pressures and, and different things like that. So for your wife to be able to do what she did and basically become a single mom, a lot of that time yes, shows just how strong she was and is. Well, that was, that was God working in our life. Absolutely. You know, that, that was God working in our life, Doug. You know, I don't, I don't have any credit for any of this. That was God directing our career path, our lives. We were rewarded for all those sacrifices. You know, we have two fine men now. Uh, I have grandkids. Everybody's just healthy and doing well. My wife, of course, she does have some health issues, but right now she is doing great. That's great that she is because she deserves she deserves to be good, doing great, yeah, especially in your retirement. She does retirement years together. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that that a lot of first responders have to have uh, side jobs just to make uh, the extra money that they need to do what they need to do, and yeah. sometimes just because they want to, but a lot of times because they need to. We need to, yeah. And, and by the way. And the major events, you never knew me doing student ministry. You knew me as a musician. That's what I was known for and am known for in in the North Carolina area. But in Florida, where I'm from, in different parts of the country, what I'm known for is student ministry. That's what I spent the majority of my life doing. It's where God took me. And I would use paramedics and, and, and firemen 
at many of our major events, as well as police officers. We would have them there to make sure that when we did a large event, and we had multiple large events a year, and the one thing you want to do is you want to make sure that your, your students are safe or if something happens immediately, you have someone there to take care of them. That's right. And that happened not many times because we tried to be the safest, safest organization possible. We used firemen and paramedics and, and police officers. And you guys meant the world because it said to our parents, it said to our church, it said to our community, they care enough to be there. And part of the time we paid extra and part of the time we did not. It was just a service that was given. And by the way, if you're listening to that, to this, and you're a youth pastor or a community worker and you work with students and you need firemen, paramedics, and and police officers for things like that, find a way to pay them extra. Because once again, they're taking, a lot of times you, we would hire you guys on your time off so that you could be there the yeah. entire time. As a department, we loved interacting with the public, and we loved what they call pub ed, going to churches, going to functions throughout the city, uh, having, having uh, people come in, bringing groups from churches to the fire station so we could talk to them about fire safety. And that's another impact, what I was talking about. When you look in the eyes of these kids, you don't know what's behind those eyes, Doug. When I was young, they had no idea what I was going through as a child, being with an alcoholic father, the tragedy of a house fire that we spent almost a year away from my home. So I, I, used to, I loved the public education that we gave the public and, and being able to get out in the public, going to churches and doing functions like that. And of course, we, I work for a municipality and we were not allowed to take money like that. We didn't care anything about that. We didn't care about any money. We uh, we just loved to be able to interact with uh, kids because, like you said before, you never know this kid may grow up to be a fireman, firefighter someday. When you spend a career of 30 years, and when you get to kids that are five or six years old and, and they come to your pub ed shows, when they get older and have a family and they come by the fire station, They'll say, I know you don't remember me, but I was here and so-and-so and so-and-so uh, when I was about five years old. Now they're coming back and, and with another generation of children that you get to see. So it, it really is really gratifying. Well, that goes along with the nature of the firemen. Tell me what type of people become firemen, because it's got to be a special personality, Because, and especially what you're talking about, the one thing I've seen is... Police officers are great. They're awesome. They're amazing and sheriffs and all those. But the firemen seem to be more of a loving, caring, nurturing type of individual. Am I right there? You are. We actually live, if you work for a municipality, we actually live together. We cook. Of course, we clean. When, when I used to bring kids through the dormitory when we had pub ed, and I'd always ask, I said, how many of you guys make your bed up at home? you almost never get a hand go up, you know. Right, right. And I said, all of our guys, all of our folks have to make their beds up. It's important if you've had a long day to get into a fresh bed and be able to relax. You can see their eyes just get really big. So, yeah. you know, I'm sure a lot of them, hey, mom, and dad, I need to make my bed up, you know. But uh, that's, that, uh, you're right about the, uh, the loving and caring. Uh, we're family. When I retired, Doug, it felt like I was getting a divorce. Wow. Uh, it really hurt me down deep to leave my extended family. I say they're extended, but they're not extended. And you, you, can't, you can't really get people to understand. It's hard to get people to understand. Uh, when I say my extended family, we live together. When I left, it felt like a divorce. It's really hard to grasp that unless you're involved in it. People don't understand who we are and what we do for a living other than we wear funny clothes, you know. We drive a big red fire truck. It's, uh, it goes really, really deep. And when one hurts, generally, all of us do. You know, I just had a fireman pass away. He was one of my captains, and he passed away about five months ago. And I still want to pick up the phone and call him. Then I realize, you know, he's not here. He's not here. 
and uh, it just it just really hurts uh, deep, and it hurts uh, hurts me to see his family like that. You know, they they missed their dad. Yes, and it was a line of duty death. He had a heart attack. Oh wow! Uh, when stuff like that happens, it uh, it has a long and lasting effect on your department. There's a special breed. It takes a special breed. If there's anybody out there listening, uh, you're even thinking about the fire service, you'll know. You'll know once you get into it if it's for you or not. And if it's not, then don't try to make it work. If it's not for you, don't try to make it work because it won't. It's a glorified job on the outside, but on the inside, it is nasty. It is dirty. It is long. It is hot. It is cold. It's wet. When it's raining, we're standing outside. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. You'll find out pretty quick whether it's for you or not. Yeah, one thing I tell people when they're they're joining a student ministry, especially in the area of middle schoolers, so it sounds similar. I asked first. I ask them. I said, "Do you like middle schoolers?" And if their answer is <laughs> yes, then I'll go. You need to be here. Then this is the place for you. <laughs> yeah. And if they say, "I don't know," I said, "Well, come spend a few weeks with us doing this, and you'll know." <laughs> and the ones who say no, I'll go. That's the right answer. Uh, you don't like them. You don't need to be here. You have to love that job. You have to, because we're not a, a firefighter's not getting rich. We're not getting rich doing that job, and it takes a toll on you. Before I left the service, I ended up with post traumatic stress mm. disorder, and it takes a toll on on your body, it takes a toll on your mind, and it takes a toll on your family. Tell me two things if you can. We always like to ask, you know, what was your your worst moment and your best moment. People relate more with their worst moments, but what I also tell people, don't tell anything you can't tell. You know, Doug, I think uh, one of my worst moments, I had a high school friend, very, very, very close friend, loved him to death. He actually worked for the city at one time, got a call to a suicide, and I didn't know. You know, you never know what you're going to walk in. Every call is different. They're none of them the same. Uh, it may sound the same, but once you get there, it's, 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 it's not. And when I walked in, I said, uh, who we got? And they called his name. And I said, no way. That hurt me as about as deep of any call I've ever had. One of my best friends committed suicide, and I was there. It took a long time to get over that. And I, you know, I'm still not over it. His life, um, it disappeared for no reason. You know, a lot of those things can be fixed. He took his own life. I think some of my some of my best moments after the tragedy, my shift that I had, we would always get together at Christmas and take up money. All of us would pitch in money, and we would try to do something good for the community. We would pick, go to a school, uh, give us your most needy children. We would go to um, social services, give us your most needy family. We'd pay electric bill, water bill. Those kind of things were very, very rewarding. Uh, we had a house fire. It involved a single parent. Uh, she had two or three kids. Her house was uh, a total loss, and it was that time of year. And I went to the shift. I said, we always agree on what we're going to do as a shift. I said, now, we've just had a tragedy. Single mom with kids. I said, what do you folks think about taking up for this young lady? And, of course, immediately. It was absolutely. We invited her to the fire station. Uh, we gave her a check for about seven hundred dollars. Wow! At, right at Christmas, and of course, you can imagine uh, how thankful she was. You know those kind of things. And I have one more, Doug. You have time for this too? Absolutely. We were called to a, a working fire. It was a trailer fire, and uh, there was a tree down on this trailer. And it was a woman trapped inside. That's what the call was. So my first company got there, and of course, it was a working fire. So they pulled the lines, and they were fighting fire. And this tree that had fallen on this trailer was absolutely huge. It went through the middle of the trailer all the way down to the floor. It just it ripped it open like a can opener. Her husband was outside. He said, my wife is still inside. I said, do you have any idea? where she's at. He said, yes, she's supposed to be on that sofa right there. And you could see it. You could see the sofa because the uh, the siding was ripped open. The tree was laying across. 
the tree was laying across this sofa, Doug. And he said, that's where she's supposed to be. So we went to work trying to get to this lady. And I looked at one of my firefighters. I said, I want you to tell me if she's alive or not. I said, look under this tree into the sofa. I said, tell me if she's alive or not. He looked at me with a really strange look. He said, you're kidding, right? I said, no. I said, I want you to look and tell me. He bent down and looked and he called out. Doug, she answered him. We got her out and she had no injuries. She said the fire was in just a few feet of her. She wasn't burnt. They took her to Baptist and they released her that same night. She came up to the fire station and we had conversation with our shift. We took pictures. It was in the paper. And I told her, I was the one, I was, when we got her out, when we got the sofa out, I looked straight down. I was the first one to see her face. And I said, God's not finished with you. And she said the same thing. She said, I asked her, I said, did you know we were there? She said, I heard you. She said, but I was in a talk with God. Oh, wow. She said, we, God and I were talking and nothing else mattered what was going on around me. She said, God had me. And she said, we were in deep conversation. And I said, you got to be kidding me. That's, that is so awesome. And she spoke to my shift and she said that same thing. She said, and you could see we were part of uh, that that day. We were part of something really, really special. In my 30 years, I've never run across anything like this in my life. We were part of something special that the Lord let this lady live. She was still praising his name with this huge oak tree laying across the top of her. And it was mashing this sofa. And God was holding it up. Yeah, we call those God sightings. And, and that, that is just uh, an amazing thing. And I know that you had to have seen God sightings like, like that. And, and here you are. You've told us. Here is one of them. That lady should not have been alive. Even my firefighter, he looked at me, and he's a God-fearing man. He looked at me and said, are you kidding me? I said, no. I said, I want you to look up under there and see if she's alive. He had this amazing look on his face when he looked at me and said, she's alive. Well, Kevin, let me tell you, uh, thank you for your service. You know, we talk about military guys, Army, Navy, Marines, uh, Air Force. But let me tell you, firefighters are in the armed forces. They're in the armed forces on the ground for us. They are. Every day, everywhere, and they're risking their lives all the time and, and ready to risk their lives, trained to risk their lives for us. And so, brother, thank you for, for doing that. Thanks for uh, being my uh, one of my trumpet students, one of my few trumpet oh, students yeah. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I miss those days, yeah, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, those were good days and, and fun. Yeah. And now uh, the man who's been in service for so many uh, in a community and for 30 years and now serving your, your family and loving your wife. When you see a firefighter, uh, whether they're on duty, off duty, thank them for what they, do, what they do. It is so important to encourage because, you know, we, even we put the uniform on, we're still like you are. We are still human. We hurt. We cry. Uh, after a call, we cry. What could I have done better? So you, you, you thank a fireman. Because this is really important to encourage these first responders. Absolutely. I agree with that. Well, Kevin, go see your wife and go hang out with her some more tonight. Tell your boys I said hello. Jordan and I have got to spend some time on the phone over the years together. And yeah. And just very grateful for your sons as well. Well, it's, it's good talking to you and your ministry for God. You know, he, uh, we don't leave him out of anything. He is, uh, he has been there for me. He has held me up many, many times, and I, I, I still fall short. I know that uh, I'm a rag compared to his glory. Yeah, you, you just can't you can't out thank him, and just we just we just praise him. All right, brother. Listen, I'm out of here, and and you have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, Doug. Thanks, buddy. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. 
Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.